That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> hey, Dennis, Dennis, Dennis. Oh uh, yeah. Are He's you, Polish. Are you are you are you still alive? You're looking good. Oh God. Yeah, you know, it's uh it's that thing, you know, like Groundhog Day, you know. I mean I showed that movie and... to my kids recently. We've been for going... the first time for them? Yeah, we've been going through this uh this eighties um film festival uh in our quarantine. And uh and they, they enjoyed it. It um Yeah. I've seen it so many times as the view, I'm sure. And then showed them, well, I showed it to them the, the next day, and then the next day. No, uh. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> of course you did. So we're, you know, we're we're uh, we're buttoned up here. It's gotten uh, it was beautiful out. We have our neighbors got uh, six dogwood trees that are the kind of the colorful barrier between our property line and his on his side of the fence, of course. And those have blossomed. And in my research, wondering. Well, how long do they last? Well, the answer is almost a week now. I'll send a picture to you. You can uh -huh. uh, download it. But also, I came across the idea that uh, this one uh, Wikipedia indicated that the flower is uh, noted by an altogether not unpleasant fragrance. And yes. I thought, well, that's strange for Wikipedia to nuance if it was... I mean, why the double negative? What, what, and so I went further <laughs> and found out that a great deal of people apparently think that the flower of the dogwood tree smells like uh, cum. And my wife actually found this so when she told me, I said, what did you say? And she said, this is, I can't believe it. She said, people, a lot of people apparently think that it's, it, it, it smells like male jism. And I said, well, <laughs> damn, now I don't, I don't want to go out and smell it. I don't want that memory. I just smelled it and it smelled good. And so the, I didn't smell it again until yesterday because there was a windstorm. I mean, it is tree uh, reproductive matter, right? I mean, your pollen and it stuff. It is. So. It is. So what you're saying, though, is that sometime I'll get a boner and it'll look like a freaking tree blossom. I know, you know I know a creepy amount about the dogwood because the dogwood flower is the state flower of North Carolina, where I grew up going to school. And we had, uh, like in the second and fourth and seventh grades, uh, we, we had part of our, our course was learning about our state. And we learned all about the dogwood flower and the dogwood tree, how the uh, the myth goes that the dogwood used to be uh, tall and straight. Uh, and I don't know if it was like used for the crucifixion or something, but somehow God got angry at the dogwood and uh, fucked it up. So it's all gnarled now uh, in a uh -huh. way that is, is with, unbecoming. With, with the only the most one of the most beautiful flowers and trees ever. So right. Which, I is, which is crucifixion I shaped. And oh, there are little, yeah, there are little well, hints of red uh, coloring in there, like uh, Jesus' blood. As, um, as we speak. I don't know. It's all just speak. this back solving onto religious myths that we do uh, as humans. Yes. So. How about the, um, the uh, news, which I wasn't totally aware of. I knew that, that Trump, you know, is, 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 uh, yeah, is, is, known for these pictures of him with evangelicals it following of course his his statement in the uh in the rose garden on the way to get the uh the, the helicopter that he said that uh he looked up to heaven and he said you know i've got this figured out i'm chosen i'm the chosen one and he looked up and that little clip is weird he's obviously being his typical foolish asshole but then people follow up and say yeah 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 and so there's a quote by the secretary of state mike pompeo that indicates that he was speaking, I think it must be to a religious group, or certainly a, a group with which religion was a very safe topic, that he referred some way to Trump as the king that will save the world, and that we will all be around. We will all be around, meaning at least we will participate in what apparently is some reference to the rapture. Uh -huh. This is our secretary of state, you know? Yeah. Did so I, we'll, we'll, oh, my God. There was, a, there was an article, I think it was in the Rolling Stone like I actually handed my phone to my wife because she, uh, despite the fact that Spain has an official government religion, uh, she and all the other Spaniards are really confused at just how in, I was going to say inbred, but uh, how ingrained uh, 
religion is to U.S. politics. Um, and it it really was when when Bush was when W was was president, and like that's that's what we were all worried about. Is oh my goodness, he's bringing in all this religion into the, the government. Uh, and now we have had Obama, who is basically an atheist, and uh, and Trump, who is certainly an atheist. Obama but was an atheist. Uh, that's my that's my statement. Yes, uh, and. We'll, we'll 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 go back to that if you want later. Uh, he was a Democrat, man. <laughs> he, was, he was pretty a religious. Let's let's call it that. Uh, uh, he went he to was, church. He, he got in trouble. He, there was controversy over some of his religious choices. The the minister, right? yeah, 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 yeah right, of course. But anyway, but, I don't want to get in the way of your story. Go ahead. No, but uh, there was this uh, there was this painting in this article. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was a Rolling Stone article. I'll I'll have to dig, dig it up. Uh, of Trump in the Oval Office. Uh, being hugged by 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 Jesus, uh, and you know Trump just with his arms down by his side and just sort of limp and you know helpless, and Jesus just holding him. And the whole article was about how uh, how the religious right is like doing all these these uh, logical uh, backflips and uh, contortions yeah. to to convince yeah. themselves that Trump yeah. is one of them and is yes. and is and is a sent from God and stuff. Whereas Trump in in him. In himself is so. He, there is no moral core there to to attach no. any religion to. No, um, no, there's no soul. Right. The, exactly. the article I sent you about Trump being soulless. Yes. Was it from the Atlantic? Yes, I think so. I think it must have been astounding a depth to it. And it's always interesting and fascinating to me when we've spoken. And in, in, I think at the last episode, I might have come unglued. I was so angry at Trump, but uh, <laughs> it's whatever. But um, that I see my exact words written by an author who is certainly yes. much brighter and insightful than me, but not just close, the exact words. There's a sentence in his article about uh, the scariest that, that, that you recall. I said that the scariest thing for us as Americans should be reading a verbatim uh, a printout of what Trump exactly says at these conferences right. and their incoherency. And, and, and this is exactly what the Atlantic writer, you can remind us all of his name, but uh, it's, it's good to know. It's reassuring. See that, ah, oh, you know, you're not out there. You're not out there alone. But, but you know, and so as we speak, Trump is preparing his. He wasn't here for Sunday, but you know, for the daily briefing. But today, of course, he is um, coming back, and he's got his conference about five thirty. And, and the subject is going to be, without a doubt, without a doubt, New York Times article that came out today, that is the most uh, informative complete, historically accurate depiction of what's happened, who said who to what, what agencies knew when that's ever been published. So once again, not like the liberal networks need something to happen for it to be fair game to talk about how late Trump started, but now it's fueled again. And at the same time that Trump is forming another task force to determine economic uh, issues, and it's being widespread reported that everyone knows this, you know this, I know this, the federal government doesn't have control over whether states close or not. The Constitution is clear. That's a state role. And, and while Trump could declare an emergency, which he hasn't done, he could overwhelm that perhaps. But the way that he's chosen to do it is for them to do it. So he could say what he wants about coming back. And the trouble is a few of the dumbass governors will listen to him. Right. But Cuomo and, and uh, Newsom, they certainly won't. A lot, a lot won't, yeah. Now, it's such a, like, in a time when it would be so beneficial to be united as in see the name of the country. Uh, we, the fact that we're leaving everything up to each individual state means that each state is having to compete with every other state to make a higher bid for the ventilators or whatever. Uh, yeah. so, so, you know, I, I've, I've seen, uh, governors talk about how, you know, uh, they, you know, they made a bid on the ventilators and they, and they were accepted and they, and they, and they went to bed all, all more or less happy that they were going to get so many thousand ventilators for their state. And then they wake up the next morning and, uh, no, now some other state has outbid them and now they don't have those ventilators. And right. this whole thing where it, why are we making this a free market capitalist, uh, zero sum game when we don't have to like, there's money to be made. And Trump supporters have convinced him to stay out of his way. There was an interesting response by the, uh, the general who's in charge now, the fourth or fifth that we've had in charge of the distribution. So they have a military man. That what you just said was was quoted back to him with with why is that? Why do you call that system working? And he said something that's true and quite substantive 
to try to explain something that isn't reasonable. And what's true is this, is that those distributors, there's seven top major distributors of masks, for example, in the world, and those distributors have amongst them a supply line that's three and 400 warehouses deep amongst them. Where they get the stuff, how the stuff is made, when it's made, and most importantly, how it's delivered in some cases directly to the doorstep of a hospital. And so what he says in response is, I'm not here to mess with the supply chain. We can't possibly do better than that. So we're allowing the marketplace this and that. He's using that as an excuse as to why he doesn't do this simple thing that's within the president's power and control the price. Right. and say, I am taking over everything you just described, and you're all doing it for the same price. If you don't do this, it's treasonable or whatever the, yeah, sure. the level of, of, of offense is here, which, which I assure, I would be assured would be pretty steep. But, but it's interesting how, the, and the reason the country gets in trouble with this, and he's still 44% has gone down quite a bit of people that support his response to the, to the COVID-19, but it's gone down a couple, three points. But it's interesting that when that general says that, He's very convincing about that. And that makes good sense what he said. But but if you're not like if you're not ready for the follow up, right, which is to say, why don't you control? Then it sounds perfectly logical. People say, wow, that's smart, man. If you're really right, smart. right, exactly. If you're if you're the kind of goldfish that uh, only pays attention to the last voice that you heard, uh, then then, yeah, like you can make great arguments for all kinds of bad ideas. Uh, that's. If you don't take a moment to think and be skeptical, you will fall into. So, uh, so, so Spain is uh, Spain is uh, looking contained. I read today that there was some uh, uh, patterning uh, showing the trend is starting to go down, and some discussions that some called too early of some returns to normalcy there, or such as it'll never be again, or what's the status? Uh, they are opening some factories and things that had been closed. Uh, Starting this week, um, it's one of those things where you can't really know uh, whether it's too early until you try and and see if people die. Uh, well, the total totalitarian response, as you describe it, there is something that everyone should really be aware of because I saw a graph today, the typical one that we see all the time, of different uh, rates of uh, increase in. Uh, I don't think that it's. I think it is test uh, test results, which is not the right. Right. One to see morbidity. Morbidity is the one to look at. That, that that yeah, but morbidity. You don't need a test. You don't need a test to know that somebody's dead. Okay, right. right. A rate of morbidity. Rate of morbidity. Uh, the, rate, again, with with what denominator though? Uh, the, the the population at large. Okay. Not sure. the tested po the larger population. That's a number that's good. Sure. But no matter what, the the the, the charts will look similar. Yeah. But 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 you can see Spain in that mix as being one of the countries pred predicated by. China, uh, Saigon, other places such as that, where you can see the pattern down shifting, which now is changing in those other places, and they're opening back up again. Apparently, the, the issue isn't so much too soon. It's opening not well. It's opening in a way that's subpar. Right. It's opening it and then people not wearing masks and people not social distancing. So if they're opening up a factory into a totalitarian state and they say, this is very strict, this is the thing, you come to work, everybody clocks in two minutes after each other, we clean everything, you go to your stations, we're at half half uh, capability so there's more distance between right. everybody blah 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 that sounds like where my where my wife works uh she had she had all of uh all of last week when she was home and she's going back to work tomorrow and they do this thing of uh checking everyone's temperature a couple times a day and uh doing extra hand washing and gloves and and masks and shit all the time right um right so yeah somewhere i saw was it sweden maybe where they they just they're like opening all the restaurants again, and oh, I that, I, I might have heard that, that seems, in a very negative way. That yeah, that seems really very risky. negative. Way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I would not do that. Uh, however, it's it, it's an interesting data point to have to you know to see what happens if you do that. But uh, you know, I wouldn't risk. Uh, I would not want to be there, and I certainly wouldn't go out to a restaurant if I was in Sweden. So, well, and see, the point is too is that you know the uh, the politicians from Trump, who has no authority, and has become increasingly a source of more entertainment and gossip than anything with any amount of credibility. I mean, his his credibility a, a, a most, a, amongst the, the the world population, which is reasonably informed, is so distant from what they care about. 
uh, it's 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 really just entertainment now. That it doesn't matter that much, but then even a state which governor, is, which is what he's good at, say we're, like that that well, is so the only thing he's good at. Right, that is the only thing he's good at is being an entertain right. entertaining buffoon. Right. Uh, so and, tell me this. Anyway, on the evangelical uh, tone again, go ahead and, and ring up the seven deadly sins, uh, because that article that I forwarded you about the follow up to the Atlantic article about him being soulless is this article that I found the info about Mike, Mike Pompeo in the speech about, you know, Trump being the king, I guess that comes back again, blah, blah, blah. And the reference to the rapture is my conclusion more than what's in that article. Um, but they reference uh, uh, in the article in a way that I can't quite recall the seven deadly sins. Yes. And when I, when I clicked on it and I looked at them, I realized that Trump hits a seven out of seven. So let's go through them. Number one, lust. Lust. It's so obvious. He he without, was he was we, spying on teenage uh, pageant girls, and his lust for them absolute in. power uh, trumps that. Oh God, I've done it. Do you, do, I've did done you the use that slip. God damn it. Oh Lord. Right. Number two, gluttony. Oh my God, he's like the size of a fucking house. When he walks away, do you think that you've seen the pyramids? I've never seen. He should never wear khakis. What's next? <laughs> Uh, I know. I think he's innocent of this one. This one is uh, greed. Oh. Hey, click on <laughs> billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions. How long did that go on? 15, 16 minutes. Yeah. All right. What's next? Okay. I, I think he's. I think he's innocent of this one. Sloth. Sloth. <laughs> right. He, no, he's saving. No. Is he, the the but, human body is a battery, and you don't want to walk between golf between the green and the next tee. You need to take the cart, so that right. you don't this, wear out your battery. Best, most recent example of his laziness is that a reporter asked him a fairly erudite question of, so what will be the sources of the data that you'll be reviewing in order to make this decision, which, as you say, is the biggest decision of your life? And he pointed to his head and he said, it's all up here. It's all up here. Because he is so fucking lazy that he won't read. He won't listen. He's dismissive. Well, and unless it, it's why would, why would any other source from outside his head no better than what's in his own head. I mean, Schlock, what do you think his exercise regime is besides pacing and masturbation? What do you, what could it be? No, nope, I be? think that's it. I think that's it. It's uh, all right. What's next? Uh, all right. I, I think we got to let him go on this one. Wrath. <laughs> He's never been angry. <laughs> did you, did you see how he called uh, Chris Wallace, a Mike Wallace wannabe? <laughs> and people are scratching their heads and saying, wait a minute. What, a, what, what, what did Chris Wallace do? <laughs> he, ha he hasn't done anything. And no matter what the, the station's saying, that, you know, you know, enough of the name calling already, which is interesting from Fox, but he blows up. And I read I, I read a couple of different things that Chris did. Chris is Chris is one guy in Fox that I can listen to. Right. <laughs> he's, he's, he's professional, but he well, got there, kicked there's out this, of the There's this problem. All right. A wrath. Wrath. How All about, right. about that, wrath that was number five. That was number five. Number five. Number, number six. Envy. <laughs> He envies any man with a bigger dick, any man with bigger hands, and any man who actually is a billionaire. Because as many times as he said billions, he doesn't have billions. Nope. I wouldn't be surprised that he has no liquidity whatsoever. No, no, zero, Except zero, zero. the cash that he's not allowed to carry in his fucking pocket. Yes. What's next? Yeah, he is he is greener than the Hulk when it comes to envy. All right, number seven. I don't. I think we have to quit him on this one. Number seven is pride. <laughs> seven it's fucking, out of it's, seven it's seven out of seven and I'll tell you what let's do a survey you know and let's just post it up there and I'll bet you that we'll get back nearly 100% agreement here's to you man seven and hey, out of seven holy shit and hey I want to I want to what, what, where, where are we at today what's our what's our what's our call number what you can find the show notes for all of the articles and stuff that we have referenced, including a link to the seven deadly sins at happyhour.fm slash zero five six zero five six. So I want you to do something for me. Humor me. I know you don't like to do this as a good producer, but I want you just for a second, just for a second to bring up the two pictures that we started our whole history with of the of the ancient oil painting in the cathedral yes. before the woman was hired yep. to, to restore it and afterwards. Just for a second. That had to be, that might, might have been episode one. That was one, yep. That was number one. Was it one? Yep. So, because we didn't, we didn't do much of a, uh, 
much of a tribute. But but if you when you get a second, show it to me because because I want to I want to see it again. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, that was a well. I can just go to happyhour.fm slash zero zero one. As you could too, you lazy fuck. <laughs> I don't want to. I make too much noise when I start hitting my mouse. Uh, and click on Jesus Fresco Restoration. And I will send this to you. Beep, 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 beep. Ese homo. Where you have the beautiful, beautiful Jesus on one side. And then the monkey man on the other. And this is so representative of our I, loss of I, way. I, 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 I cannot, I cannot this is get real. enough of that second photo. I, I remember, of course, how funny it was. Right. But it's been, well, it's been like a year. Yeah. Do, are we at a, uh, well, our anniversary date is not of any. Uh, yeah. But so, yeah. So as it says in the Wikipedia article, <laughs> rather than rather than the original title of the painting, Behold the Man, uh, they now call it Behold the Monkey. <laughs> Eche Mono. Which is... Which is Eche Mono. Which is really <laughs> so representative <laughs> of our discussion. Instead, instead of Eche Homo. Eche... <laughs> Eche Mono. Indeed, indeed. Oh, God. Too funny. Thank you. I needed a, I needed a laugh. <laughs> oh, Lord. I've got a couple of non-political uh, uh, things we can talk about. As I mentioned, I've been showing my kids some 80s movies. Close your screen. Yes, I did. I had to get rid of all the shit. <laughs> uh, and the other day, because it was on, like, your our, our Spanish TV channels after, after the news, after lunch, in the afternoons, on the weekends especially, uh, they will put on uh, some sort of movie. Oftentimes it's really just terrible, terrible movies. Uh, but they do this thing where they show you 45 minutes of the movie and then they show you 20 minutes of ads and then 45 minutes of the movie. And so, uh, anyway, yeah, nice they, 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 they put on this, they put on this movie that, uh, my wife and I, uh, said, Oh yeah, we should watch this. And we got to the ad part. We decided to stop and do something else. But then I went and I, uh, I found the movie and we watched all of it. The movie we watched was gremlins. Do you remember this movie? Yeah. 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 With the creatures. And like they're they're so cute the little the little the little guys and they have all these rules about how you can't get them wet because it's with a little drop of water they like multiply and if you feed them after midnight that's when they turn into these little pods that then the following day wake up to become the evil gremlin uh, bastards uh, and it's such a crazy eighties movie like it's, some of it is actually fairly scary but I mean my my kids. It's, it's kind of a testament to how safe my children feel in their lives that they're never really phased by scary movies. Uh, but they uh, there were some, some some scary moments, but then a whole bunch of like uh, just goofy comedy stuff. Like at, at, uh, towards the end, all the, all the all the gremlins are at the local movie theater. And they're all watching some. They're all watching some silly movie. And you know that was one of those tricks back in the day where they would uh, in the movie they would show people at the movie theater, and you'd be like, "Oh, that's, that's, just, movie, that's right. just like us. We're here in the movie theater." A movie, a movie within a movie right. within a movie. Uh, right. And uh, but they would just do silly, goofy things and, and be very be very human. Like they were uh, they were at the bar drinking whiskey and smoking, and one one of them was like under the under the beer tap and was like just guzzling beer and stuff just your typical 80s debauchery uh crap right, but, right. but done with these puppets. i do remember it i do remember it. we saw it i, re I recall <laughs> i meant you you had a you had a, a a moment where you talk about um george bush and the the connection of politics and religion yes. and i meant to mention a moment that i've been binging on the newsroom a great um boy that uh, is liberal masturbation at its finest yes and jeff daniels from michigan just up the road in fact yeah um and i we mentioned his son ben's band and jeff playing in the band and this is one of these episodes recent and i'm in the second season now but um he's shown at a party at his apartment and he is playing guitar 
with another guy in the movie who's also a very good guitar player, and they're singing a song in harmony, and it it shows you a side of Will McAvoy right. that you don't otherwise see anywhere in, in in the movie. It's also an episode where he takes two marijuana cookies and instead of eating a part of one, eats two of them, and it's it's at his house at a party, and these these young people that he he works with gave it to them, his girlfriend, and it's the night that they uh, murdered uh, or retaliated against Osama bin Laden, and so he does the show absolutely high. <laughs> he gets found out in later episodes, right. but it 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 is interesting, exactly to your point in in, a, in an episode I just saw which is in the, the political year 2011-2012 prior to the election, is the emergence of the Tea Party as the place that really this lead-in to where we are now began. Um, is so explanatory in a way which I kind of knew if you were to if we were to talk about it and you were to say, well, let's go back, where did it start? I wouldn't have been nearly as cogent as I am now because of this right. wonderful couple of episodes where they do this. And they're doing right now in the episode I'm in the election of 2012 uh, between Obama and Romney, which was exceptionally focused in the early days about Romney's switch from Massachusetts governor when he said there is no way that the founding fathers did not believe in the separation of church and state because he was a progressive Republican when he was governor and how he completely flipped that and said that the, the, the country was founded on Christian principles, which there's certainly some reference to that, but certainly the Constitution is not one of the documents that you reference to find that particular point. Uh -huh, right. Um, no, very I, well done. Very well done. During the Bush administration, I was very well versed in uh, in the counter arguments against why against that idea that the that the U.S. was was a Christian nation and whatnot. That like all of really most of the founding fathers were were deists, which is the only reasonable thing you could be before Darwin, uh, which is, yeah, there must have been a creator. He started things going, and then we haven't seen him since. Uh, like uh -huh. that is that is the scientific. Uh, it's like what you could. It's the as far you could you could go to atheism before Darwin came around and and, ex and explained that no, actually, all of this stuff could have just happened from nothing. Uh, and anyway, uh, like Bill Maher. Uh, uh, a guy that you reference sometimes uh, was really big in, into that uh, in that movement. Uh, he had that um, movie called Religious, which uh, which he where he, he sort of goes and mocks that uh, that type of not religion, not religiosity. I think it's called Religious. I think you're right. Religious. Yep, nineteen. Oh, nineteen. It's a two thousand eight American documentary film. Quite written, good. Written by starring uh, Bill Maher. Yes. Uh, and and that was when uh, I don't know there were some there was there were some uh, r some writers that, that were nicknamed the Four Horsemen. Uh, there's Richard Dawkins and uh, Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett and Christopher Hitchens. Uh, all came out with books about how uh, like it, no one was really anti-religion until 9/11 really sort of flipped things and we everything everybody got polarized. Uh, but anyway. I have a an object to show you. I don't know where it came from, but it appeared on my desk. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pen. Oh, is it really? It's a pen. One you won't lose anytime soon. That is. Is uh, it a witchy woman? Stitched. Uh, it, it, there's a woman with a dress, and it's and the and the word Bolivia, on it. So. <laughs> witchy woman. So I don't know. She got. Yeah. Love in her eyes. Yeah, so this is a beard. It's it's kinda it's kinda cool. I imagine it'll run out of ink at some point, but it isn't uh it isn't a slip on? No. I mean it doesn't slip off. It might have slipped on at one point, but uh So you wanna you wanna talk about your new hairdo? It's quite striking. It's quite striking. It's uh, it looks like uh, a partial mohawk, but in fact, it's just a bunch of hair on the very top of your head, partially hidden by the uh, famous well, uh, ankle uh, coming out of your forehead. But well, I mean, what is a mohawk if not? Uh, well, a, a mohawk would head. go all the way back down the top of your head, all the way down well, the you back of you your head. Well, you haven't seen the back of my head. Uh, however, I am, I'm right though. It's just in the front. That's because when my when my hairdresser uh, 
who who I live with, uh, was your five year old. Yes, no. My my wife was was I. We agreed. All right, let's let's try to do a mohawk, and she she started buzzing around, and without thinking, she she buzzed off the back, uh-huh. so it, it can't go all the way back. Um, so you look a bit more like a unicorn than I a mean, mohawk. It goes, it goes back. Well, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, I got it. So, yeah, okay. It's a, all right. It's it is it is what it is. Um, and so, I realized uh, it took me it took me a while to realize um, who I most look like. Uh, at first, I was like, "Let's see, who's famous for a mohawk? Name someone with a mohawk." Um, Again, we're going back to the '80s. Good Lord, Ice. Ice. So, I mean, you, Ice, you, Ice, baby. Bum, ba, da, dum, ba, da, da, oh, I don't think uh, Vanilla Ice had a mohawk. Vanilla Ice. Uh, the, the the one that comes to my mind immediately is uh, Mr. T. Mr. T. Me too. Uh, That's with, the image uh, I had. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't uh, yes. gather up his name much better than I could Vanilla Ice, frankly. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. But but then I realized uh, what it really is is Robert De Niro in the Taxi Driver. Oh yes. You talking to me? Yeah. You talking yeah. to me? Which was ad lib. Which was ad lib, by the way. Yes. Uh, it's Scorsese let him go. It, there was something in the script that that had him looking in the mirror, yeah. and De Niro just went off with it. That's such a such just a classic off. classic scene. Um, oh and, yeah, well that whole that whole movie and the the characters in it and the actors who played those characters. It's it's it, but it's it's also such a, a, a to the bone chilling, frightening movie. Right. Just 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 awful. Uh, that it is that you don't want to see it again and again. You know, it's like the movie, you know, Seven. Yes. Speaking of Seven Deadly Sins. Exactly. The best movie ever written about the Seven Deadly Sins. Yes. And I think Brad Pitt's best performance any movie I've ever seen him in. It was one of the few movies I've seen him in that, that I forgot for a moment that he was an actor. Right. Well, you know? and we have discussed him on this show several times, uh, both in Ad Astra and in Once Upon a Time in, in Hollywood. But Ad Astra I haven't seen yet. You haven't seen that after yet? Uh, no, no, no. Where, is is that a? That's not an HBO. That it's. I don't know. Probably available somewhere. No, I've seen it on Netflix, maybe. Some streaming I'll bet service it is. has it. What is the name of it? Ad Astra. A D space Astra. It's Latin for "To the Stars," I believe. Well, and I remember us talking about it and me making a mental note. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I remember me. making a Wait mental a note about making a mental note. About making a mental me note. making a mental note. Well, there's a lot of assumptions there. Exactly. So anyway, now you have a, a written note. Um, but yeah, he uh, that that movie is like in, in there are many movies that that people may have seen and they don't remember seeing, but that is a movie that if you've seen it, you will fucking remember having seen it. Yeah, there is yeah. no no one sees that movie and then is like, Meh. oh, did I see, uh, did yeah. I see that? I don't know, uh, because it's it's just uh, one of those. And to be honest, I don't know that I was really familiar with the concept of the seven deadly sins before I saw that movie. Uh, oh, I wasn't. I didn't have a whole lot of religious education. Certainly not, uh, you know, strict Catholic stuff like the seven deadly sins. And that was like it had. I didn't. I wasn't aware. Of that, there was a list of, of of bad things you could do. Gluttony was the most grotesque seven or eight minutes that I've ever yep. seen in a theater seat. And I, I that's the one I must remember. I, I, for, I still have the images. I don't want them. <laughs> um, but you've got to take them along. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to see the movie or would skipped it. So. It's sort of like smelling your your old socks. You know they're going to stink, but you smell them again anyway. Yes. The movie Seven is like smelling your old socks. It's Dennis's <laughs> right. review. You, you know that you're not going to like it, but you do it again anyway. <laughs> yes. So that was that was Morgan Freeman Yes. right, right after Shawshank Redemption. That was the year after. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is, you know, peak Morgan Freeman. He's pretty, he's pretty astounding. Did you see the movie with Scarlett Johansson where she played the person that became um, moving toward pure uh, thought, energy? 
and she grew her, her brain expanded and expanded until she became one with all knowledge some sort of it uh, it it was uh, AI. named after a girl's a woman's name um well i mean she was lucy. lucy lucy i did see that i did see that uh i don't recall a whole lot about it but so morgan freeman's role there particularly in the first part of the movie the opening of the movie where he is explaining things in a professorial manner is such a classic. When you listen to his narration of what you see before you on the screen in great rapid uh, succession, learning, just absorb, because the movie's so well done right. that it teaches you so much. But it's it's one of the classics of, of Morgan Freeman, considering his disembodied voice, well, and which is in itself. He's, he has his the voice best, is a character in and of itself. He has the best disembodied voice, like... Uh, everyone, uh, everyone generally agrees that uh, if you wanted a narrator for your life, you would have North Morgan Freeman be the narrator. Except uh, I would, cho- I would choose the guy who does Arby's. Well, we got the meats. <laughs> He's you got to you got to plug into him. You got to plug into him. The guy who does Arby's. I will look that up. We've yeah. got the meats. It is. It's. And you'll see why, for me, in my life story, that he com- competes successfully against Morgan Freeman. I can see Morgan Freeman doing yours. You've got a, a certain seriousness, eruditeness to you that I missed altogether in my life. So I would choose the RB spokesperson. Um, not to be confused with the, with the voice of Darth Vader, uh, James Earl Jones. Well, um, my, my, my Google search just now on uh, Arby's We've Got the Meats Guy turned up a lot of James Earl Jones. But I think uh, it's actually Ving Rhames, which is um, uh, who's, who, who died uh, recently. No. no. Yes. Ving Rhames. Yes, he dead. did. Check it out, bro. Sorry, man. No, he's age sixty. This is this is the guy that played uh, Marcellus Wallace in Pulp Fiction. Uh, yeah. No, he's still alive. Oh yeah, right. I thought he was dead. No. He. So who am I thinking? Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, the guy who played Eight Mile, uh, or um, yeah, that not Eight Mile. What am I saying? It's not a rap. Not a rap. <laughs> um, the eight, Green Mile. Green Mile. Green Mile. Right. Uh, green Mile. So, did you see the Green Door or the Green Book? <laughs> did you see the Green Book? Yes, I saw it. Yes. What did you think? Did we talk about this already? A couple times. Yeah. Uh, anyway, okay. No, I know we did. It. Uh, I know we. Did. It's, it's good. It's good. Um, I've got. Uh, Got some other cut topics. First of all, did you know that like all this month it's 420? Man, wow. Works for me. Did I just blow your mind? This whole month. <laughs> I knew there was a reason for it. <laughs> yeah. That, oh, oh, that explains it. <laughs> yeah. So in other news, um, have you ever done a Sudoku? Do you know what that is? It's, oh. it's these. Uh, it's this grid of numbers that you have to fill out such that you oh, know, oh, yeah, use yeah, yeah. the same I, number. I do know what it is. No, I don't. I've never. I've never done it once. Yes, I. Ne- me, neither had I. Tried. Neither had I. Uh, but then I was searching for math problems for my to occupy my children during the quarantine, and uh, I downloaded one and, and printed out a PDF, and. Um, and I, like the very very easiest one was really hard like I, I get I was a, I was able to accomplish enough of it such that I realized uh, why people enjoy it like this whole uh, this, right, this right. when this turns out here it's uh, you know when this aligns then you can then figure out these other things and it all sort of falls into place but then I ran into, this, then that. but then I ran into a, a to a moment where uh, I had gone too far and uh in a way that I had to, you know, had, had to reverse back. And it was just frustrating as hell. And so it, it's such a, I can see why people like doing those things, but man, what a, I, I, I well, saw, I get, saw you, enough of, of, of it to know that I don't need to do any more of those. And you saw the addictive nature of it. I, I caught a glimpse of the addictive nature, uh, but also of the pain involved and decided uh-huh. that's not for me. Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, you know, don't let your kids do Sudoku. It's basically my my message. Mothers, don't let your children grow up to do Sudoku. 
Let them be liars and militant sawyers. Let them know. Hey, uh, Willie Nelson was interviewed by Bill Maher. Was he not? Just uh, one of his. Uh, Were they smoking? He's he's and and you remember uh, you remember well they talked about it. Remember the episode when I I I said you know what how do you get a hold of um, what's his ass John Oliver so I could uh, John Oliver and tell him about the buttons yep. and then Bill Maher did it. Yep, that was not the episode. buttons though. So. Right, we talked about Bill Maher too. Yeah, that was oh oh because I saw episode. the second I saw the second Bill Maher episode where he, he did it again and it's interesting that. It's just clear that Bill Maher, unlike a lot of these comedians, can't, can't be without at least a laugh track because he can't he's that, get he's that his shallow. rhythm otherwise. Well, I, I wouldn't, or, I wouldn't go there because um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a Pavlovian response. I mean, right. It, no, it's really, it's really, it, really hard. I, I, uh, it's unnatural. It's unnatural. I, I gave a, um, I gave a talk this past week. Uh, where it was a thing that, that I had booked like four months ago and it was always going to be an online only presentation. Uh, and at the time, four months ago, I thought, wait, really? Who gives, who gives a, who gives a talk only, only online. And now uh -huh. that's uh, what everything is doing. Uh, You're ahead of your time. But it was, uh, it was really awkward because there was just no feedback. Uh, there was just no energy uh, that you get from speaking to a, to a crowd or even to there was no one person or even one person on the, on the, on the video call. Uh, there was just no, I was just speaking right. and it was the, it, the sound was just going out into the void and, and, and nothing. So I, I can definitely feel that itch that Bill Murray is scratching with that, with that sound yeah. stuff. If you're, uh, if he's actually hearing it, at the time, if he has someone there that is pressing the button to let him hear it, because if it's added later in post or whatever, uh, it's not. I, I don't. I don't. Then, then I don't that's, think so. That's, then that's super silly. I don't think so. There's no way that his delivery could be calibrated. Okay. Be so much easier. He, he waits until the he, applause is over or whatever. There's a certain point in the laughter where you jump in right. with the next line. Yes, it, right. It's not in. It's not. Uh, it, It'd be hard to calibrate the laughter that way, although you could do it easy enough, I suppose. Right. But the other thing is, unless it is also a feedback mechanism to the to the speaker, to the jokester, then I don't see there's no, where there's it no could value. even yeah. be construed as being all that helpful. No, it's got value. It's just not. It's just not. It's not a high value. Well, when I was when I was uh, editing our last episode where we were talking about this and laugh tracks and stuff, uh, I found some videos of episodes of TV shows uh, like Friends, for example. Uh, where you there's on YouTube you can see you can see the episode without the laugh without the without the laughter like they were doing stuff in front of a studio audience so they right. they had uh, the actors when when they were performing the scenes could get a feel for when the laughter was stopping and also they of course they've got people uh, standing in front of the crowds uh, saying okay everybody quiet now or whatever uh, but uh, there's a there's a version of some of some scenes where you don't hear the laughter and it's really awkward because. Uh, someone does something kind of funny and then everyone in the room is just sort of waiting until, you know, for, for two seconds to pass you, by. And then they, without and then the they, noise, you don't. Right. Yeah. And, then, and then they continue. Without the soundtrack, the you don't know why. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's so bizarre. Like, you know, obviously, in a way that if you, like, actors on the stage, you, uh, people then when they act on, on the stage know to wait for the applause for whatever the last singing number was to to finish before they continue with their next line uh but if you if you cut all that out so, it's really awkward so. so it reminds me of my most awkward moment on stage and i'm tell? almost certain that we've never spoken of this if we have i'd, I'd be surprised but okay. then again my memory is not measured in gigabytes here we cut to the commercial and, break after this message okay <laughs> yes continue <laughs> that um i was in uh, oh oliver twist and I played the, uh, the the fat man, who was the um, the landlord or the, the the he ran the orphanage among other things, and it's in the scene where the the uh, the child in a famous scene, iconic scene, that you see uh, 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 talked about a lot right. in different venues where the child is holding up a bowl right. and is asking for more. Yes, of course. More, sir. 
Well, the one who was offering up the Morser was, was, I believe, if I recall this correctly, my daughter. But I was playing a fat man. And in order to play the fat man, and I had, I was in charge of all my own prosthetics and, you know, it was a community theater, so there wasn't like a budget or anything. And so I had made myself fat. And the problem that I had with finishing the fat look was that you could use pillows and gray your hair and, and do this and that with makeup and whatnot. But I still had I can a tell, you, neck. You do this every time we and, record. And a skinny neck. <laughs> yeah, I do spend a lot of preparatory time. So in order to fix the neck, I came upon the idea, not unusual, I was supposed to cover myself with scarves uh -huh. that went all the way up to my chin. So, you know, you took that completely out of the equation. But in the scene, um, which wasn't the famous bowl scene, it was another scene where it was clear that I was uh, eating and drinking a lot and wealthy enough to be able to gorge myself like that. Uh -huh. And I was to take a drink and then it called for me to burp. And I've never been one to be able to burp on demand. I've got to have a burp that actually arises. And so I figured out, of course, that I needed an effervescent drink. Oh, and because on the opening night, I wasn't able to burp. And instead of burping, I ended up just looking at the audience, opening my mouth and throat and going, right. <laughs> because I could not raise a burp. I ended up drinking what amounted to about a half a quart of effervescent like club soda. And I never could ever get the burp out ever for the whole it was it was a show that had no audience to speak of it was a limited audience i think we ran four nights but i never got the burp out every night was an embarrassment and of course what caused me to be unable to burp in public even though all that effervescent was there, was the fear that i could not because if there's one thing that will cure a hiccup there for a burp is fear fear cures burps Hiccups. Well, okay. So, wow. You didn't know any of this. I didn't know. I didn't know about the physiology involved of anxiety, uh, hampering uh, gas ejection, or this whole being nervous to hiccup. So, yes. so if gas someone ejection. <laughs> so if so if if you've Let's got go the, if, if, you, if you've got the hiccups yes. if you've got the hiccups. And then Samuel L. Jackson comes up to you and says, hiccup one more time, motherfucker, and points a gun at your face. That'll cure your hiccups. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Samuel L. Jackson, yeah, right. that would work. Good choice. <laughs> Good choice. Say what? One more time. Yes. That's Whew. classic, classic scene. So, so we, have we talked about the uh, Quentin Tarantino movie, the... Uh, the something eight. What is it? The, 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 ter the horrible, the terrible eight, the horrible eight. No, worse than horrible. No. Not the horrible eight. No, the, the what eight? Da, da, the ma da, 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 not magnificent. Da, 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 da. Hateful. Hateful eight. That's so, that's, um, it's got that great, um, alliteration. And uh, uh, only because Samuel L. Jackson's performance there was um, the only thing that beats that is um, his first movie with Quentin Tarantino, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction, yeah, the one I was referring but, to. Yeah. But not, nothing else comes close. Yes, uh, he is. He's good. What I what I love about Samuel L. Jackson is uh, in all of his interviews, he seems like just such a cool dude that you'd want to hang out with. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, not, well, just, the commercials not, he has with... Uh, of course, you know, he, he he loves to golf, too, and is always on those pro-am tournaments. But uh, one thing that he says that very few actors will say is that he likes his own movies. Like, he says, if I'm flipping... If I'm sitting on the couch on a, on a Sunday flipping through the channels and I come across a movie that I'm in, I'll stay and watch that. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's right. some good shit. That is, that is unusual. <laughs> because You've normally people the hate their own, their own material. Him, him, Spike Lee, Charles Barkley commercials... For, um, no, uh, I don't see commercials. Real? Oh no, 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 no. This, it, me too. But you won't hate these commercials. No, no, I didn't, because, didn't say hate them. I say don't see them. Oh, you don't see them. Yeah. Oh, well, you can you can find them. But Spike Lee, Charles Barkley, and, and Samuel Jackson often on road trips together. Charles Barkley driving always is the butt of the joke between Samuel Jackson and Spike Lee. They're hilarious. Barkley is Barkley and, is a is a funny guy. And I'm certain not only are they hilarious, 
largely due to the fact that a lot of it is probably ad libbed. Yes. It's happening before you. They are genuinely <laughs> laughing and, and, and having a, a, a great old time. Exactly. Charles Barkley, you know, had political ambitions, and don't be surprised to see Nears 70 years old. He's younger than I am by several years, I believe. You know, check his age while I'm talking about this, but he does have ambitions to become governor of Alabama. And that's something that he might do at the tail end of his career. How old is he? He is 57. Yeah. The young, young 10 years. Man. Yep. 10 years. He and, could be governor of Alabama. Yeah. Uh, I heard him recently on, there's a, it's kind of frustrating for, for those of us that are, that are nobodies trying to make it in this podcast world. But uh, there are some of the most popular podcasts now are from people that were previously celebrities for other stuff that are jump, jumping into podcasts. And one uh -huh. of them is um, Conan O'Brien is uh, kicking ass. Yes, in the podcast I saw space. that. And, uh, I saw that. And he, uh, he, I heard one of, with him and Charles Barkley. And Barkley's just funny as shit. Uh, and apparently uh, he's, he's sort of the comic relief uh, on uh, ESPN or wherever. He is, he's, a, he's a commentator. And uh, he's just a all-around clever dude. Uh, you know, he was, he had that, um, he had that mystique about him as being sort of a, uh, a brutish uh, bad bad guy back in back in his early NBA days. But uh, he's uh, he's got a hell of a head on his shoulders and is uh, yes. is pretty darn clever and, and funny in general. Uh, he's yes. another guy that it would just be cool to hang out with. Yeah, yeah. God, he's only six six, short guy for the NBA. Wow, I didn't know that. He's a little guy. Yeah, he's he's uh, he's he's not a small man. No, he's two hundred and fifty pounds. <laughs> oh boy! But uh, yeah, yeah. So I did watch the. I did watch the video of the uh, dogs. You sent me in the sports. <laughs> Wasn't that great? It was it was it was funny. Done in the perfect tone, the perfect golf. Uh, Apparently, tone. the, the I, guy that made that is actually a sports uh, caster. Sports announcer. Very uh, funny. That clip did make it into uh, the latest uh, some good news, John Krasinski uh, episode. I yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to dig into that so, further. So, <laughs> that whole and uh, as well as some other clips of people uh, taking taking recordings of other newscasters saying stuff about uh, about things that, that have happened and, like, playing them out, you know, in their kitchen. You know, oh, he yeah. passes over here and he shoots and he misses and they pass it back out for the three and he shoots and he misses and they pass it back out to the three and he shoots and, and he scores. And these people who have just rehearsed that and practiced it yeah. enough to the, right, to the point right. where uh, if there's if the last basket goes in, then, then, it, then it matches. Uh, right. Just <laughs> funny, funny yeah. quarantine content. Yeah, yeah so you, did you send me the horse contest? The horse contest. Did you see that? Oh, oh, the NBA is doing a horse contest. I heard about it. Oh God! Oh God! You should, you should, okay. you should see it. You, and there's a woman, a woman or women uh, involved in it, um, and it's all virtual, of course, and everybody's home court in their home or some private place where they have it, and uh, it's going to go on for weeks. Nice. It's, it's, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like everybody's waking up to the fact that we're settling in here. Yeah. That's 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 some of the worst of it. Well, listen, bro, I'm going to go outside and uh, smell the uh, the uh, uh, cum stainish view of the beautiful uh, dogwoods that I'm looking as the sun comes out for just a brief moment in Kalamazoo. And it's 36 feels like 28. It'll be balmy out there. I might light a fire and uh, who knows what to you, my friend. Well, go stick your nose in that cum flower. <laughs> Spoken like a true patriot. <laughs> Hallelujah, bro. I love you. Man. Be safe. You. I love you. You too. Okay, that's it for episode number 56. Thank you very much for listening. Everybody stay safe. If you'd like to help support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash happy hour. All the show notes for all these crazy links that we have in this episode can be found at happyhour.fm slash 056. And please, everyone just be good. Stay safe. Wash your hands. And we'll see you next week.